Uh, I'm not. I'm not Delegate Dolores McQuinn, um, who is still in the House of Delegates, but is supposed to be introducing this program. Um, my name is Ben Campbell, and I'm an Episcopal priest in Richmond and involved with Virginians for Reconciliation. Thank you all for coming tonight. And in, in my uh, my other job, I usually say. Um, Episcopalians always sit at the rear, do you want to come up front? <laughs> so if you want to move up, fine. We hope there'll be some more students here after they finish voting for election. Jamal, I don't know how long this voting takes, but... Well, I left mid, so it may, you know, they may... Who knows? They may, they may come in. Good. Um, so we, uh, this is co-sponsored by the Virginians for Reconciliation and also uh, by VCU and Virginia Union. And um, Virginia Union is represented here by um, Dr. Joy Goodrich, who is the provost and the senior vice president of academic affairs. And um, VCU is represented by Dr. Uh, Rosalind Hargraves, who's the associate vice president for assessment and transformation in the Division for Inclusive Excellence, which she tells me means she does a lot of projects. <laughs> and um, I know, actually, I know she does because I know some of the of the great projects she's been involved with. But the, actually one of the really exciting things is that in January, VCU and Virginia Union um, agreed, um, and these people were a part of it, to uh, three dual degree programs that are coming through the two universities working together to begin next fall. And I think that's a really great step forward for our city and for our academic community. Um, I, I'd like to say just a word about what Virginians for Reconciliation is. Um, basically, we need to be reconciled. Now, you can talk about what reconciliation means, and that's part of the reconciliation process. Uh, but Virginians need to talk about race. 400 years after 1619, um, Virginia's a mess, and the, and the, the great Grand Canyon of race is still a major thing in this commonwealth. I think it's because of 400 years of, of deliberate, often unacknowledged uh, hierarchy and inequality in terms of status and structure. Uh, but whatever the structures are, it's also put us in enmity with one another. So the process of reconciliation calls both for um, working on the, on the structural changes necessary and also working on the enmity and lack of understanding that's present. You know, I can't, I can't help anybody do this work. It's hard enough for me. But the fact is we need to do the work. Virginia's Reconciliation is trying to encourage various opportunities for dialogue and study among various groups in the Commonwealth. If you look on our website, which is what, VFR? Anybody know what it is? VirginiansforReconciliation.com. That is good. VirginiansforReconciliation.com. You will see the list of things that we are helping to happen. But frankly, you can do your own thing. But you need to do something. Um, this, this Commonwealth actually could be a leader in the problems that it's helped to create in solving them. That would be a really nice way to start the fifth century um, of presence of African Americans in this commonwealth. Um, and it, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. So raise your hand if you think there's work that needs to be done. Yeah, there is. And that means everybody needs to do it, and you basically know the work you need to do. It does mean, however, doing it in concert and in conversation with a person who's not the same race as you. Just saying. And for white folks, it also means talking to some white folks. And for black folks, it also means talking to some black folks. There is work that needs to be done. We would really, you know, if we could say at the end of a year or two of being intentional, um, that in fact the Commonwealth of Virginia had begun to take seriously its original sin and become more what it was we said or thought we were to be, um, we, would, we would all be able to celebrate together. So that's, I am a preacher, that's my deal. <laughs> <laughs> and, you do a good job. 
Thank you. I'm a white preacher, and that was why I was only five minutes. So that gives me a chance for a joke. So, I had a friend, um, African-American guy, who used to preach to both white groups and black groups. And he said that the hardest time he had was preaching to integrated groups. And I said, why is that, John? This is John Coleman, some of you may have known John. And John said, you know, when I'm preaching to white people, what they're really interested in is a sermon that begins on time and ends on time. <laughs> and when I'm preaching to black people, they want an event. <laughs> he said, now the problem when I get in an integrated group is I've got to create an event that begins on time. <laughs> so with that, I'll turn this over to Roz Hargraves from Virginia Commonwealth University. So I am not a preacher. <laughs> but you will, you will get an amen out of me um, from, during a good sermon. So thank you once again for having me here this evening for this awesome event. Um, I'd like to extend my warm thanks to Reverend Campbell, to Delegate, Delegate McQuinn in her absence, and also to our Virginia Union um, and Virginians for Reconciliation for hosting and organizing this wonderful event. Um, I'm standing on behalf of my president, President Rao, who um, sends his warm regards. He is with his family during this spring break week that our children are in. Um, and I'm very proud to represent VCU. I've been at VCU now for 23 years, and I've watched the institution grow and change um, to be what it is today. And I'm extremely proud of the collaboration that we have with Virginia Union with our 3-2 programs that we have coming up. So, um, as you may know, VCU is committed to the advancement of knowledge, student success, research, and innovation that improves the human condition. Um, we are dedicated to our core values of collaboration, freedom, integrity, and diversity. In order to stay true to those core values, we have to believe in a dialogue and having dialogue about subjects that are challenging. We are an institution of higher education. It is supposed to be in those institutions when we can have these difficult conversations. In order to move forward, though, we have to reflect. And we have to have an honest reflection about our history. We can't sugarcoat it. We can't pretend it was something that it was not. And we have to be open to that. We are at a critical time right now for both our commonwealth and our nation. And I hope that as we move forward, we can be honest with ourselves and look to our past for lessons that we can learn as we move forward. The com these conversations we will have will be difficult. And they could potentially bring out feelings that are raw. They can be a touchstone for certain things we hold dear and deep. But we have to be able to face those things and embrace them in order to move forward. So I am excited and I'm looking forward to participating in this conversation. I believe this is a safe space where we can really be honest and say, look, these things Ha can and will be said in ways that are respectful, but also ways that are necessary. So thank you for having me this evening. And thank you. So this is her place, and, the, and this is Joy Goodrich, the provost of Virginia Union University. Good evening. Good evening to our invited guests, 
Governor McDonald in his absence, Reverend Ben Campbell, Delegate Dolores McQuinn in her absence, Dr. Hargraves, our colleague at VCU, Ms. Lynn Jackson, Mr. Charles Tanney, Virginians for Reconciliation, all community members and students. I bring you greetings from the Virginia Union University and also in the absence of our wonderful president, Dr. Hakeem J. Lucas. Welcome to our campus for such an auspicious occasion. Given Virginia Union's rich history of educating newly liberated slaves, as well as the descendants of slaves, it is fitting that we would, we would be poised to co-host such an event. Tonight, we invite you to listen intently and enthusiastically participate in the discussion on truth and reconciliation. It is in this way that we seek healing from the wounds of our past and fervently pursue greater racial equity in the Commonwealth. Again, good evening. Good evening. At this time, I have the distinct pleasure of introducing you to our Student Government Association President, Jamon K. Phoenix. He is an Atlanta native, a senior studying history and political science. Upon graduation, he wants to attend law school at either Howard University or the University of Richmond to become a civil rights attorney. Civil rights and social justice is important to Mr. Phoenix, and I quote him. I grew up just down the street from Dr. Martin Luther King's first home. He was always reminded by his grandparents that you always are to treat people with compassion and love as well as forgiveness, Mr. Phoenix says. But he said as he grew older, he discovered those concepts were missing from the world. That led him to want to pursue a legal career and to fight for social equity, <coughs> criminal justice, and the right for all people to become productive citizens. I give you Mr. Jamon K. Phoenix, our SGA president. my biography, um, I want to first of all say thank you, thank you all for coming out today. I'm sure more students will trickle in. We are, get, we are um, in the throes of our election and campaign season, so we have campaign night tonight. Um, so as you can imagine, you know, it, it's going to be a good one for um, Virginia Union. <laughs> I want to say welcome. Welcome to this historical campus nestled, as I say, in the north side of this jubilant city, located in the greatest commonwealth in the nation. Um, as we all know that this is a historical campus with our hallowed walls and dear old grounds, and I will bring you greetings on behalf of the students, but must we recognize that Virginia suffers with historical issues, and those issues just so happen to be about race and how we reconcile with each other concerning that very thing. Um, I would first, no, I'm sorry, second, um, want to welcome up someone who is a counsel for me, someone who is um, everything, I would say a professor, a dean, a chair, um, a president, a principal, um, a dad sometimes, um, and understands who I am as a student, um, Dean Ritter, as I will prophetically call him, um, to the podium next. Uh, this. I would say Dean, um, he's, a, he's a chairman Ritter as I would know him, but Dean Ritter is um, a dynamic person who understands the nuances of racism and how we deal with it in the nation. And so as he comes up here, I expect you all to give him a round of applause and welcome him. And I want to welcome you all again to our amazing in class, so there are no grades. <laughs> uh, let me also add my welcome to our historic campus. 
on behalf of Dr. Lucas, our president, my boss, Dr. Goodrich, uh, we're glad that you're here. We welcome this conversation. It's something that we have experienced as an institution, uh, certainly, certainly as a city of Richmond, as the Commonwealth of Virginia. So the effort by Virginians for reconciliation uh, are very appropriate and, and very heartfelt for us. So we welcome you. Thank you for being here. Uh, I especially want to welcome and thank our panelists uh, tonight. Uh, and we'll talk about them here in just a minute. Uh, Format-wise, what we're going to do is we will have uh, Mr. Tawney and Ms. Jackson to speak to us about their experience, uh, about why they're here talking about truth and reconciliation. During the course of that, uh, there should be as I understand, there will be people passing out cards, or you will be able, to, members of the audience will be able to submit questions, and we hope to have a little time at the end of our session for them to respond to any questions that you may have uh, as well. So, let me uh, first of all introduce our panelists. Uh, Lynn Jackson, <coughs> Ms. Jackson, is a direct descendant of Dred Scott. She is the great great granddaughter of. Dred and Harriet Scott. <clears throat> she now lives in St. Louis. She's the president of the Dred Scott Heritage Foundation, uh, which promotes, and, and their mission is to promote and educate and to commemorate uh, and to reconcile uh, issues of race uh, in this country. Uh, I want to talk in just a minute briefly about the case of Dred Scott versus Sanford. It was written by Chief Justice, the opinion in the Supreme Court was written by Chief Justice Roger Taney, <coughs> and we're fortunate to have, <coughs> excuse me, a direct descendant of Chief Justice Taney with us as well. Uh, Charles now lives in Connecticut uh, and is devoted, I, I think he's now retired and he's on to his second or third uh, career of uh, activity, especially like the fact that he's now involved in some nonprofit environmental work. Thank you. Uh, but he does some other things that we'll talk about as well. And I think it's a unique opportunity to hear the perspective of a descendant of the Chief Justice who wrote what many regard as perhaps the worst opinion ever written uh, in the Supreme Court, and a descendant of the plaintiff in that case uh, as well. <coughs> Reverend Campbell, I'm not a preacher, uh, but I am a teacher. Uh, so let me first of all, for those of you who are not familiar with the case of Dred Scott versus Sanford, let me briefly uh, encapsulate that opinion that happened in 1857. Ms. Jackson will talk about her family in, in connection, but as you probably know, Dred Scott was born in Virginia, uh, born into slavery, ultimately moved to Missouri, uh, where he ultimately lived in a variety of places. Uh, before uh, ultimately his master died and of course at that time uh, he was placed, he and his wife and, and uh, children, I think there were three children at the time, maybe two children at the time, were placed in the estate as property. Uh, Dred Scott said, I'm not a slave. Uh, Missouri at the time adhered to a, a policy called once free, always free. And he had lived, he and the family had lived uh, in free states and free territories. Uh, and so his legal argument was that he was no longer a slave. Uh, so he filed a lawsuit in state court, uh, which of course was not successful. Ultimately files in federal court in St. Louis uh, a case against, at the time, the administrator of the estate, uh, a guy by the name I think was John Sanford. It's one of the few Supreme Court cases where there's a typographical error in the, the style of the case. Uh, it's actually Sanford without a D, but historically, because the clerk put a D in the name, we know it as Dred Scott versus Sanford. In any event, the case gets to the Supreme Court, uh, and Roger Taney writes an opinion where he talks about uh, the historical factors that make Dred Scott not a U.S. citizen. Uh, in fact, uh, according to the opinion, anybody who is descended from <coughs> slaves who were brought from Africa in bondage, even if they had since been freed, were still not U.S. citizens. And so the end result of the case is, for Dred Scott, 
he loses. The case is dismissed as to him uh, because they said he doesn't have standing to bring the case. He's not a U.S. citizen. He must be a citizen to file a lawsuit in federal court. Now, that's the impact on Dred Scott and his family. The bigger impact of Dred Scott versus Sanford is what the court went further to do. Even though it was not an issue in the case, they took the opportunity to invalidate what was called the Missouri Compromise, or the Compromise of 1820. In 1820, the state of Missouri wanted to be admitted to the Union, and they wanted to be admitted as a slave state. As you know from the very beginning, from the writing of the Constitution, there had been this tension between free and slave states, the balance of power. That's why the Constitution contains the three-fifths compromise that said slaves were counted as three-fifths of a person. It was designed to equalize the power of North and South in the House of Representatives based on population. So in 1820, when Missouri wanted to be admitted, that would, that would alter that balance of power. And so what the Congress did is they passed a law called the Missouri Compromise where Missouri was admitted as a slave state the state of Maine was created, the top of Massachusetts was lopped off, and a new state was created, the state of Maine, and it was admitted as a free state. So there was that maintaining that, that equilibrium. Now, they also went in, in the Compromise of 1820, they said in the future, any state admitted north of 36 degrees 30 minutes, which is basically the southern boundary of the state of Missouri, any state admitted after this, north of that line, must be admitted as a free state. <clears throat> south of the line, they can be admitted as a slave state. Well, the Supreme Court in Dred Scott <coughs> said that that was unconstitutional, that that law was unconstitutional, and they invalidated it. The result of that was northern states were concerned because now slavery could spread north of that line, Southern states were concerned because now they anticipated further pressure to abolish slavery completely. And it was one of those, in 1857, it's one of those important steps leading us up to ultimately, of course, the Civil War. So the impact of Dred Scott, the case, is monumental. Uh, one of the five or six monumental cases in Supreme Court history dealing with issues of race. And so we're, we're happy and pleased to have this conversation tonight. Uh, as has been mentioned by other speakers, Virginia is uniquely situated to have this conversation. It is the 400th anniversary of the first slaves being brought to the United States, 19 individuals unloaded at Jamestown 400 years ago. We are unique in the sense that we were the capital of the Confederacy. We are unique in the sense that we have ongoing conversations and discussions about things that have occurred in this state over the past several years, several months, where race has become an issue. So we welcome Virginians for Reconciliation and the effort that they're making to have this conversation. Uh, and we certainly welcome you here. So with that, let me ask our panelists to, to get involved. And let me start, if I could, by just simply asking you how this unique partnership that you have came about. And tell us a little bit about that history. Okay. Well, good evening, everyone. Good, good evening. evening. You know, you've heard all the people involved who are responsible for our being here, so I won't reiterate, but I do want to thank all of them again, including Pastor T and Lynn Ross, who are here with us. And uh, they were phenomenally um, involved with our success today. We had a wonderful day. And so hopefully, Charlie said he hopes he doesn't nod off, and I hope my voice doesn't go away. But we're going to survive this and share our story with you. And the story starts with me starting the Dred Scott Heritage Foundation in 2006 because the 150th anniversary was going to be on March 6th of 2007. But in 1995, I got a little tap on the shoulder from upstairs that said, clearly, you should study Dred Scott. And we've always known our whole lives that we were related to him. It was, it was very clear to everyone that knew us and historically that we were the descendants. But 
I said, yeah, you know, you're right. I should know more than the average person. So in 95, I just started Googling and researching and doing whatever I could over the years. I filled up 20 notebooks of research of my own, not knowing anything about what I was going to end up doing. And so uh, when it got closer to the time and we formed the foundation, I said, there's three things that I need to accomplish, thinking that I would, you know, a couple of years and then I'd go back to my life. <laughs> But those three things were to commemorate the anniversary, to build a statue of Dred Scott because there was none that existed in the world, and to find someone from the Tawny family. And that's the three things I wanted to do. I was done. But somebody else had another idea, and I wasn't done. But I never could find the Tawny family. And, uh, and, and years rolled by, and years rolled by. So. Um, my thought was, whenever I do find them, it's going to take at least two years to talk to them, hopefully they call me back, and I'll have to convince them that we need to work together, and this is going to be important, and this is going to be good, and we need to work on reconciliation. And I was very sure that this was going to take at least two years. But instead, I got an email one day from a young lady who said, my name is Kate Tawney. And I was blown away. And she said that she had done something very special, which I'm going to let you tell. And, um, and could I come to New York? So, you know, I'm going to skip all this because I, I know he likes to tell the story. It's his daughter. <laughs> but as it turns out, we did get to meet. And it was an incredible experience. And so I'm going to share more of that, but I'm going to let him say, wait, we're going to just probably talk back and forth a little bit about this because uh, we both have our side to the story, which blend very well, but um, he's the dad, so I'm gonna let him, she, let him brag on his daughter and how this happened. It's because of her, and her mother's right here in the front row, Carol, too, so I'm indebted to them. <laughs> okay, well, uh, again, thanks for having us here. Thank you very much. Um, so I thought I'd just, I'd just kind of break my remarks into three uh, sections. First, I thought it'd be interesting to tell you, you know, what's it like to grow up as a Tawny under the legacy of Roger Brooke Tawny and the Dred Scott decision. Then I'll tell you the origin story of how we got together and then a little bit about our reconciliation between the Scots and Tawnys. <coughs> so, growing up as a Tawny, so it was a mixed bag, right? So, uh, you know, big Catholic family, eight kids up in Connecticut, in New Rochelle, actually, where I grew up, I said, New York City. And uh, we were proud of Roger Brooke Tawny. There was a portrait of him hanging in our dining room where I grew up. And we were proud for some pretty good reasons that I think we're still proud of. You know, he, he was the Supreme Court Justice appointed by Jackson. He lived to swear in Lincoln. He ran the second longest Supreme Court in, in our history. He ran that court under a time of a tremendous expansion of our country from the 1830s to the 1860s. A lot of the law we live under was formed under his court. And if you look at Supreme Court historians, they give his court very high marks as the Supreme Court. So that's the good news. The bad news is he's known for one thing. He's not known for any of that. He's known for the Dred Scott decision. So growing up, while you were proud of his, his record as, as, as an important American in the formation of our country, you also knew there was this terrible thing he did. So in fourth grade, when you studied American history, you got the Dred Scott decision, you would kind of slink down behind your book and hope that nobody connected you to that guy. You knew even then, even as a child, you knew, because our family told us what that was about. So it, was a, it really was a mixed bag, this, this, this feeling growing up. And around that dinner table, uh, with that portrait hanging there, there were some Thanksgiving dinners. We had some pretty spirited debates. And the debate was about the Scots. And it was about, well, wh what would happen if we met the Scots? What would that be like? What would we do? Would we express regret? Would we say we're sorry? So in our family, there was this, there was an argument because half, half the table was, well, why would we do that? That was then, this is now. We didn't do it. We're not responsible for that. By the way, does it sound familiar? Yes. And the other side of the family was saying, no, no, wait a minute, no, wait a minute. No, we all agree it was a terrible decision. We all agree we caused harm to the Scott family. We hurt them, right? Don't we regret that? Wouldn't we, wouldn't we express regret? And how far is it from regret to apology? So that was a debate we had as a family growing up. Now, my daughter heard that debate, as I did as a child, and she heard it at my dinner table. 
So when Black Lives Matter was breaking out, and she's an actress and a playwright in New York, she decided her contribution would be to write a play. So she wrote a play called <coughs> Time, a one-act play in this fictional story. It's a play. And the story's about a man named Tawny, about my age, who asks a Scott, Walter Scott, a Virginian, to come up and meet him at a coffee shop off the Jersey Turnpike and have a conversation. And that's what the play is about. It's a very emotional play, and I won't get into it, but you can imagine that there's a lot of sparks fly and not a lot of emotion in that play. So, so the actor studio in New York uh, loved the play and said, let's put, it, let's put this play on. And they said to Kate, could you, you know what would be amazing? Could you find a Scott that would come to New York and the night we put the play on, would come up on stage and have a talk back with the audience with the Tawny and the Scott together, sort of, sort of like art and then life working together. So Kate, my daughter went online, and if you Google Dred Scott, you'll get the Lynn Jackson in a heartbeat, because she runs the Dred Scott Heritage Foundation. So Kate reached out to, to, to Lynn, and Lynn's response, which was, I mean, it was just knocked us out. Her response was, I've been waiting for this call for years. And Lynn came to New York with that. And we met. <laughs> we had a couple of days together before the play. The play was put on. We went, we went up on stage together. And I'll tell you, it was a very emotional evening. The play's very emotional. And so the audience is really charged up, right? As a New York audience and, you know, a, you know, multi-ethnic audience. And we got up there, and I'll tell you, it was an interesting evening. A lot of questions flying around, but all good, all, you know, heartfelt from the heart, but because the, because the language of the play opened a lot, of, you know, that conversation we all think we should have, well, they had that conversation, and that was a spirited conversation. So it opened everybody up. So that that really started our 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 relationship, and then that led then to our to our reconciliation, which didn't happen until later. Because then Lynn asked me to Lynn runs this wonderful uh, program uh, called the Sons and Daughters of Reconciliation, where she has families, historic families, the descendants of Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings, the descendants of Jefferson Davis, the Scotts, the Tawnies, the Blow family who owned Red Scott. They all come together with, under. This program. So at that at that program that day in St. Louis um, is when I decided it was time for reconciliation. And you know, reconciliation, as I see it, or commonly seen, it happens in three phases, three steps. The first step is the party that's committed the injury, that's done the harm to someone, has to recognize the harm they've done. They've got to know. They've got to recognize they did it. They've got to go to the party that was harmed, and they have to get in front of them <coughs> and recognize to them admit to them they've harmed, they've harmed them, express regret, and ask for forgiveness. So I did that from the dais in front of a crowd like this that night in St. Louis. But I, I also think it's very important, because I did this that night, because the language, this. so what did Tawny say? In that, now, now, we heard from the professor a summary of the decision, but you got to hear the language that Roger Tawny wrote in his decision. So I'm just going to read you two sentences, because they're, they're hard to hear but you got to hear him. So he said, blacks for more than a century have been regarded as, a be as beings of an inferior order, unfit to associate with the white race, so far inferior that they had no rights which the white man was bound to respect. All right. You can imagine being uh, an enslaved person or a free person of color in this country and have the highest court in the land say that. I mean, that's... That's an injury. That's injustice. That's terrible. So we asked that night for forgiveness, and the Scots embraced us and forgave us. And that led to the trust, which we were good now. So that's right. Let me add a little bit to, like I said, we'll go back and forth, because um, when I did go to New York, um, I knew that there was this play, but I hadn't heard it. And they wanted to do a talk back after the play. And I'm a little bit more of a pencil person, and I thought, well, that sounds like a good plan, but I need to hear the play first. So technically, it was put on two nights in a row. And I said, you know, the first night, I think the actors and people from the actor studio, and if you want to remember, that they should talk back, and I'll listen, and then I can do it the second night. And obviously, it was such an incredible play that the second night I was extremely happy to be a part of the talkback. 
but just for the sake of it, I, I want to make it clear that I did have a check in my spirit that I needed to know what this play was before I just said okay to doing a talk back because I might not have had anything good to say <laughs> or I might have said something that I didn't want everybody's feelings, but the truth, you know. But truly, uh, whenever you have a chance to see it, and we believe that you will, you will be totally blown away by the dialogue that she gives the Scott character because that's where the injury was. And in the play, his character thinks that it's going to be, you know, like, well, I, we don't want to give anything away, but he doesn't expect what he gets, okay? <laughs> and so it, it's, it's done very, very well. But what really blows people away is the fact that when they ask the playwright author to stand up, this incredibly gorgeous young 31, two-year-old girl stands up, white girl, and everybody gasps. It's like, what? How could she have written this play? But she did, and, and so I'm saying that also to say that that was in her heart, that was in her mind. She was able to process that. And that's who the Tawnies are today, not Chief Justice Roger Brooke, but it's such a great play, and, and I don't know if you said this already, but the play itself made that dialogue <laughs> such that you didn't have to say everything because it was said in the play. And yet, you know, we obviously had our conversations, but that play was an icebreaker, and it was absolutely ordained that it should happen and that I should get to go there. So we were just tickled to death over it, and um, it, it really made a difference. I will also say this, that when Charlie did come to St. Louis for that first reconciliation conference, there were people in my family who said, I don't know if I want to meet those people. And I thought, oh, that's not like you guys. What's up with that, you know? But then I realized, wow, they're typifying what the typical person might say and do, just given the fact that they heard the name Tawny. And that's where we have to do that kind of work, because they did come. And after our session was over, and uh, the unexpected and impromptu apology was, was given, my, I have cousins who were in tears. <coughs> in tears afterwards and they couldn't believe how amazing the whole connection was. So I say all that to say that uh, there's one word that we can wrap our minds around when it comes to reconciliation and that is relationship. There was an old song called to know, know, know him is to love, love, love him and I do, I do, I do. I know some of you guys remember that. <laughs> I think somebody was talking about their boyfriend, I don't know. But the truth is, if you get to know somebody, and they are a good person, you can very easily love them. And so, that I won't go further into that topic just yet, but that that's kind of what happened. And, and it was highly unexpected, but it was right. And it was just, and I also believe it was ordained because it's almost like God said, you know, we need to put this on fast forward. So I'm going to have her do this play, and then you guys don't have to take those two years. And let's get on with this. Okay? So that's how it happened. Okay. And then, yeah, that's, so, so since then, we've been doing this in a number of different places and ways. And I think what we see happen, and I, I hope it happened tonight or happens, will happen, is that I think. Or we feedback we've gotten is you know when we see a Scott and a Tani who have gone through this and we're able to get to this place, it makes us feel like, well, gee, why can't the rest of this do that? It's, it's possible. It's possible. So I think the possibility of speaking the truth, truth telling, and rec recognizing wrong, admitting it happened, being committed to expressing regret for it, being forgiven for it, and then that's where the trust comes from. But you have to go through those steps. You have to do that hard work for doing that. So that work remains to be done, I think. And that's why I think Virginia's for, Recon for reconciliation, and they have an, they just they just started in the last year and a half or so, but they've got a really interesting program laid out. And I think anybody in Virginia, and, and by the way, Virginia's for reconciliation, it's Democrats, Republicans, interfaith. I mean, I'm telling you, it's a really interesting group of people from the broad spectrum who know this has to be dealt with, and they want to do something about it. So if you do, I encourage you to get involved with them because I think they're they're serious about it. They've got some interesting programs that they want to make happen. I need to make one more note, please, very quickly. <laughs> uh, that was, like I said, an impromptu apology, but we were asked to come and participate in another program in Annapolis, Maryland, and 
and he gave another formal apology in public. And um, what I love about it is it, it happened in front of the statue of Roger Brutani. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I'll never forget what he said at the end. He said, that old guy, if he was here and saw all this, he went, well, what the? And it was like, what, what are you doing down there? But we were doing our work. And yet that was in 200 newspapers across the country. And that was uh, a wonderful day as well. And, and what I want to say about it in particular is that he apologized not only to the Scott family, but to the African American community. And so I thought that was gracious because the trickle down effect was more than the Dred Scott family at that time. And so um, my acceptance of that was also on behalf of any African American who would accept it as well. Yeah, but we had, we had a really good idea which we could sell, oh. which was. They, they, yeah, you know, all these statues are coming down, and, and Maryland was planning on taking down the, the Tawny statue outside their state house. So we went there to say, no, 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 time out. How about this? Instead of taking down Tawny, why don't you put up a statue of Dred Scott next to it and have both of them there, and then have an educational exhibit around it to tell the story of reconciliation? What an opportunity. Don't blow this, but. Unfortunately, the middle of the night they came with the statue down, so it didn't matter. <laughs> but we tried. Yeah, we did. It was actually not in the best spot. You know, if they had moved it and done it, that could have been awesome. But it was really in the center of the courthouse yard, which you would see from a distance when you turn the corner. People weren't with that, and we understand. So, we're good. Thank you. Uh, let me, as a postscript to the Dred Scott story, you know, I guess ultimately with your definition of reconciliation, the ultimate reconciliation took place right after the decision. When a descendant of the original master, of one of the blow children, actually purchased Dred Scott, he was still a slave after the decision, purchased Dred Scott, and then gave him his freedom. Yeah. Uh, which Do you certainly want to talk about that a little? Absolutely. Okay. Well, I'll make it short because I know we have other questions, but this is a really important part. People say, well, well, what really happened to him and how did he get free and all these different questions. The Blow family had 11 children, um, probably four of them deceased, but those who remained, half of them at the least four of them, played a very critical role in Dred Scott's case once he decided to file for his freedom. And it should be noted that Harriet Scott, his wife, also filed for her freedom as an independent woman. And they had two separate cases in the courts. It wasn't just Dred. But you only hear Dred Scott because their cases got combined after a little while. They were so similar and the cost was there. But Dred and Harriet both went to the courthouse on March 6th of 1846 and both of them put their X, which actually was a cross, under the words his mark, her mark. And um, that was their uh, attempt. Now, if Harriet had won her case and Dredd had lost his, then she and her girls would be free. And I'm sure he would have been fine with that. So it was a bit of strategy there in terms of like, well, we could both just do it under you, but why don't we both go for it? So I thought that was pretty interesting. And yet, um, what ended up happening was they had five cases over 11 years. And the first case was thrown out because of hearsay. The second trial, they actually won their freedom at the old courthouse downtown. A lot of people don't know that. They won with a jury of 12 white men because once free, always free was the law. And they had the grounds, and they had the right, and they were free. But their uh, person who they were suing, Mrs. Emerson, appealed that case, and then they lost. Went to the Missouri Supreme Court, they lost. And then it went to the federal court, and they lost. And then they lost on March 6th of 1857. So it was a very long ordeal. And yet um, they were tenacious and courageous enough to see that through that very long period of time. And uh, it really impacted them and affected their family. And maybe later we can talk about their daughters because there's an interesting aspect of the family there. But um, Mrs. Emerson met her brother, John Sanford, which is what uh, Dean uh, Ritter was saying, and let him handle her business when her husband died. So she went off and married an abolitionist who she did not tell she owned slaves, let alone Dred Scott. And so he read it in the newspaper that he owned the Dred Scott family. And he was livid and he was willing to do whatever he needed to do to get the manumitted and him away from slavery. He was a congressman and a doctor and his reputation was quite soiled. But uh, the, the way it happened was when he said that their owner's child bought him Taylor Blow, the second of the youngest of all those 11 children, 
had always been there with Dred and had done whatever he and his brothers and sisters could do to help pay their, their trials or get lawyers pro bono, whatever they could do. And so when it came to the fact that they lost the case and Mrs. Emerson, now her husband's ready to kill her, what are we going to do? So they came up with a plan with the attorneys that they would sell the Dred Scott family back to Calvin Chapey for one dollar with the quote unquote express purpose of freeing them. And so on May 26th of 1857, just shy of three months after the decision, the Dred Scott family was set free and emancipated by Taylor Will Esquire for that express purpose. And that's exactly how it read in the New York Times. Excellent. Let me ask you, Charlie, if I could, uh, Lynn mentioned to know somebody, and even though she wouldn't sing for us, you didn't ask. <laughs> Don't. <laughs> and, and since I'm not a black preacher, I won't attempt to sing either. So. But I know a program that you co-founded called Breaking Bread. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. So, so I guess uh, <clears throat> reconciliation is important, and it's about hearts and minds. But at the end of the day, there has to be action. Mm -hmm. It's not just about hearts and minds. It's about, well, things have to change. We have to take action to change things. Policies have to change, laws have to change. But I ask myself, so what about you? What, what are you going to do? What, what are you doing about this in your community, in your little world? So, I, and at the same time, this is about the time that there was that awful massacre in Charleston, and you all remember that amazing eulogy that uh, President Obama, when he sang Amazing Grace that night. And he said something, and I'm going to get the line wrong, but he said something like, uh, the path to justice in America is that black and white Americans have to recognize each other, get to know each other, or something like that. And I said, well, what, what can I do? So I thought, we came up with this idea of, of breaking bread, which is a very simple idea, which is to have, if, if, if white folks and black folks would just get together at each other's homes for dinner, just because you think that's an intimate thing to have someone to your table in your house. So I wanted to start this, but I'll, I'll have to admit something here, okay? I needed a black family to start this with. So here I am, this white liberal in Connecticut. Guess what? I didn't know a black family I could ask to do this with. I had to find a third party to introduce me to a black family who would be interested in doing it. And that happened. And the, the, the Thompson family with Carol, Jim and Barbara Thompson started this with Carol and myself in Norwalk. And, and now it's been going on for several years. And we have a big dinner every two or three times a year where every, we have like thir uh, 30 people come together. But the idea really is to get people to have each other over into their homes, just two, two couples or four couples at a time at the dinner table together. And, and, that, and I had never done that before, and it, it, and it, took, it took some, you know, it, it broke, it, it, it offends a lot of comfort barriers when you do this for everybody. But it was, it's been an, a great experience. And, uh, and, and of course, a lot of your, uh, I'll speak for myself, a lot of my, uh, <laughs> I don't know what you want to call the prejudices or whatever, suppositions about people. So we have this wonderful black couple over for dinner the first time, Jim and Barbara Thompson, and I'm figuring, okay, well, they're black, so they're liberal. Uh-uh. Wow. <laughs> the wife was, but Jim, not so much. So you know, we had this really terrific, but we're both football fans, so that was okay. But uh, so we, we worked it out. But that's just a small example of what you learn about people and reveal about. You learn to, and, and when, when that starts to happen and you get to that level of understanding and relationship, other things start to become possible. So that's just an example of what you can do if you choose to do it. You can do it. It can be done. It's not like, gee, what am I going to do? We can all do something like that. And those ripples multiply into crashing waves. So you're a little bit at a time. So. Uh, I mentioned to you earlier uh, that we would have the opportunity for the, the audience to write out questions. Uh, I think we have some folks that will pass out if you'd like to submit a question. If you'll raise your hand, somebody will get you a card and oh. we'll take those up. Uh, I'm just saying. So mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Let me ask you, uh, we, of course, our, our campus is the home of a uh, world-renowned School of Theology, uh, and obviously faith is an important part of our legacy. Uh, what role do you see as faith and religion playing in this idea of reconciliation? Okay. Well, first and foremost, 
we know that we're just supposed to love one another. But we don't see a lot of that from time to time. And my background is one of being a Christian and also being like a lay minister. My husband and I teach biblical apologetics, which is a very fascinating, interesting topic. A lot of people don't know what that is or understand it. But because we do that, um, we, it has played into the fact that we've been able to help people understand how they should try to understand other people. So, um, you know, you have the, the biblical mandate, you know, and the question, am I my brother's keeper? Uh, the answer is yes, uh, but you don't want to be your brother's keeper because you don't like your brother or you don't know your brother. But like Charlie was saying, you know, you need to get to know your brother. Um, the Bible tells us that we should be ministers of reconciliation. So for me, who I am a Bible scholar, I know there's so much there that shows us how to do what we're trying to do, tells us what to do. And yet, how many people are really engaging in that philosophy? How many people really understand that? So I, I did not know this was a theological focus here at the school. I really didn't know that. But um, I'm glad to hear it. Because ultimately, when, when you are faced with uh, critical issues, uh, first thing people say is, oh my god, you know, it doesn't matter who you are or what's going on, but if you watch when 9-11 happened, everybody on television is going, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god. And so uh, that's convenient, but it's not always convenient when other things are happening. So my personal perspective is that um, I, I do believe that we are supposed to care for one another, try to love one another, but like I said earlier, you have to get to know each other. And we have grown up in a culture that has so many barriers and so many divisions, and I'm from St. Louis, and St. Louis was a border state. Uh, border state, meaning that it was literally on the border of the Mason-Dixon line, which it actually would cut through Missouri if it continued to go there. And we literally had our own civil war within the civil war. There was just so much division there. And yet, um, I, I can't say we've done wonderfully well, you know, getting over that. There's still much, much work to do there. But, uh, but we have a lot of churches. We really do. And uh, so, one of the things that happened in St. Louis was we've all heard of Ferguson, right? Did anybody not hear of Ferguson? Well, Ferguson was not far from us, and yet um, it became a global uh, event, and, and everybody knows what happened there. True. However, um, uh, with the work that I do and others around, we felt that the church should play a better role in trying to heal that situation. So to make it a short story, the Reconciled Church came out of Ferguson, and the Reconciled Church really gave pastors the mandate to step up to the plate and be more of what you're supposed to be, do more of what you're supposed to do to get your congregation to understand what they're supposed to know. So without getting deep in philosophy of all of that, the pastors did come up with what they call the Ferguson Declaration, where they did admit and repent for not doing the things that pastors should do. They let people get away, they let people slide, they let people you know, turn blind eye, well, we won't talk about that, we won't do this, and as long as you put your money in the plate, we're happy. But they recognized that they should and could have done more, especially within that community where there were those issues in Ferguson. So uh, Ferguson, well, by the way, was just a microcosm of, of things that are going on all over the country. And so um, the Reconciled Church was a combination of, of that in St. Louis, but it grew so that it actually was in Dallas and in Washington, D.C. and in Atlanta. And it actually continues. And one of the things that came out of it uh, was that one of the coordinators of the uh, Atlanta Reconciled Church program, which had almost every well-known pastor that you might think about, um, that is not impressive, but they were willing to be there. That was my point. And that we were there to, um, to awaken the church, as it were. And in Atlanta, in particular, there was, does anybody know Jensen Franklin? Yes. It was at his church, and that's a huge church. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so um, the Reconciled Church there, was the springboard for other cities. So it's actually going on all around, but one of the pastors and one of the coordinators, I will say Mike Berry and Bishop Harry Jackson in particular, uh, and uh, Louis Hogan also, had a United Cry event at the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C. 
And add that in that, uh, I wish I could tell you the whole story because it's very funny, but ultimately the good thing that happened out of it was that I was invited to be there with uh, Dr. Elvita King, uh, Bernice King, Dred Scott, Alex Haley's grandson, and another gentleman named Will Ford III. And the purpose for being there was for descendants of slaveholders to do a ceremonial foot washing to descendants of enslaved persons. And that's exactly what happened. It was a day-long event, but that particular event was extremely symbolic. And the person who washed my feet, which by the way was my boots, because it was 30 degrees out, thank goodness. <laughs> But um, he, his ancestor was the first governor of the colonies here. So it was those kinds of people that were brought together for this understanding. And, so, and it was based on uh, Martin Luther King's family, so it was interesting. But those are the kinds of things that are happening that most people aren't hearing about in the news. And so um, the church is playing a role and needs to play a greater role. And, and we need to be real about our faith and honest about who we are. Uh, this is a, kind of a tough one for me, but I, 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 I was, as I listen, I guess what I remember as a younger person during the Civil Rights Movement is that the faith community was in the front lines. That march across the Edmund Pettus Bridge, there was Dr. Martin Luther King, there was rabbis, priests, everybody you could think of was there arm in arm for that. And they were in the front lines. They were willing to take that, mark, you know, take that heat, take those risks, put themselves at risk. And I'd have to say, my challenge to the, to the faith community or the, to organized religion is where, where are they today? Who's, who's taking a fire hose today? Who's in the front line today? Now maybe they're there and I just, I'm just ignorant, don't know. But given the level of division in our country and the level of acrimony and the level of difficulty we're having, I, I guess I would, I would hold the faith community, I would ask them to be more responsible and maybe think back to the heritage they come from and ask themselves, where do we go? From here? Maybe they should be on the front line more than they are. Because <laughs> I think that's the leadership we need. I think if our faith leaders stand up <coughs> and say, this, this won't stand, this has to change. We're going to march, we're going to organize, we're going to be out there. People would follow them. I follow them. You know, but they're not doing that. Somebody help me. Um, who, who, the black robed preachers, what were they called in the Revolutionary War? Oh, come on. The black brigade or something? Yeah, no, no, no. The pastors would go to church and they would wear their black robes. But if they got the call, they would end service and then they would get their guns and rifles out from under the robe and go fight the British. And there's a name, and I'm sorry, I can't remember it, but uh, that, like you were saying, you know, they were there on the front lines for that war, and then we had our civil rights leaders, pastors, and so yeah, today, that's the question we have for the faith community. We need to actually have and we need to step up. Yeah, absolutely. And then we have that in Richmond. Uh, we can use more, but, but I know after some recent controversies, there's that interfaith coming together of a lot of different churches, a lot of different faiths talking about some of those events. So so we have some of that. But, but I think your point's well taken. The point is that we can all get on the front lines more than we do perhaps today as well. Let me ask you a question that's a little controversial. Uh, you mentioned uh, Chief Justice Taney's statute. One of the ongoing conversations seems to be about the removal of Confederate statues. Uh, in the South primarily. Uh, we of course had the event in Charlottesville uh, a year or so ago. One of our faculty members, a young man by the name of Wes Bellamy, has written a book about it. It wasn't about the statues. It wasn't about the monuments. So what is, what is your take on the removal of Confederate statues in this effort of reconciliation? Is it a part of it or is it just history? Well, what do you mean is it part of it? Is, it? is removal of the statues part of the reconciliation process? Oh, okay. Yeah. All right, so both Charlie and I feel like it's better to have a learning opportunity and not take down statues, but I think we do agree, but I know I'm saying that where they are is important, okay? It's not like 
you can just put it in somebody's face in the wrong place. And in that case, I would move it, not remove it. And that's our position because there's too much history. When I went to Philadelphia and uh, was at the Constitution Center, there were all these statues around in uh, the city area there. And I was like, wow, who are these people? And, and I read about them. And, they weren't all wonderful people, but at least I found out, well, this person did that. And because I do a lot of research, I would go back and find out who they were, and that person would lead me to somebody else. And maybe that was a good person, or maybe there was a history there that had been uncovered. So I think in, in light of um, the fact that we need to be more educated, and we need to educate ourselves, don't wait for somebody else to do it, then I think those statues play a role. But I do think that um, sometimes they are in a place that may hurt and offend people. So I, I would not have a problem with them being removed, but uh, not, not destroyed and, and taken totally away. And I think when we were there, there was a, what's it called? Thurgood Marshall has a plaza around the corner from where Tustis Tawney's uh, statue was. And it was a huge statue too. But um, we asked them to put it around there or to construct another one take the model that we had in St. Louis, which is much smaller, do something, but take it around there to that plaza where the legal conversation was being had. But like you said earlier today, I think we were a little too late to that party. <laughs> yeah, the Confederate statues, that's a really complicated issue. I mean, because the emotions run so high on both sides, and, and, I, and I think we can all understand the emotions, where they come from. And I guess my, you know, my feelings, I, I wish that the, the folks that are I wish the energy put into taking the statues down was put into something more constructive. I wish that energy was about, hey, let's change the redlining laws in this town that are keeping people from buying homes in black neighborhoods. Hey, let's take this energy and put it into changing the funding system in this city to get more funding for the underserved schools. Hey, let's take that energy. I, there's a, so many things that you could put that energy towards. And I, I guess I wish, wish that energy went to something constructive and that would, that would solve a problem. And I understand why people want the statues take it down, and I guess I'm with Linda. If there's an offensive statue someplace in the wrong place, okay, that's a conversation you can have. But I, I wish the energy went to something more constructive. My observation of their family about their statue being taken down was one of um, understanding. I mean, surely they would have rather it didn't get taken down, but they understood. And for me, that's part of the healing process that we have. He didn't fight, he didn't argue, he didn't write letters, he wasn't mad, he didn't cut somebody out. He said, well, you know what, I kind of know why they want to do it, and if they do, they do, that's what he told me. But it would be nice if we could move it around the corner. And that's the attitude we have to adopt, that you know, sometimes we aren't always going to get exactly what we but want. But it would be nicer if they put the statue address out of Oh, that was right. That was what he suggested. That was his suggestion. His family's was rather than take it down, add Dred Scott to it. We almost forgot to say that. But that's really important. That was our first proposal. Their first proposal, which of course I agreed with. But we put Dred Scott with Justice Tawney, and that was the learning experience. That was the learning environment that we were trying to create. And uh, who knows, it may still happen somewhere sometime, but, um, but that was the original proposal, was to add Dred Scott. And, uh, and so it's what it is. But I, I really admired their um, attitude about understanding that it had to come down where it was. Lynn, you had mentioned earlier in, in one of your answers that you maybe want to talk a little bit more about the daughters of Dred Scott. Mm -hmm. Would you like to tell us a bit more about their history? Yes, I would. Um, the first daughter was Eliza. And Eliza was born in 1830. Oh, was that right? Oh, 1838, right. So she was um, almost 11 when the case was brought. But she was also born on the riverboat Gypsy in the middle of the Mississippi River. Ladies, can you imagine having a baby on a riverboat in the heat of summer? <laughs> And you're a slave woman too, and so you're not going to get all this, you know, coverage and um, so forth. So that had to be something. But she was born free. She never was born free, but unfortunately, so goes a mother, so goes a child. So of course she was enslaved. But um, she actually is our great grandmother. But growing up, we were always told the other daughter was our great grandmother, and we did not correct that or find the truth of it until 2006. 
So the whole family grew up saying Lizzie married Wilson Madison, and that's where the kids came from and so forth, but it actually turned out to be the older daughter. The younger daughter was born within weeks, if not a month or two, before them actually filing their case, and uh, that would have been in 1846. So there were some years between the girls, but um, she was born on the onset of this case. And her first 11 years was only Dred Scott were suing. This is bad, this is hard, this is dangerous. And so she, even in the photograph, which, well, it's not actually a photograph, it was taken from a photograph, but the picture we have of her, she looks a little frightened. And so um, at some point, because it was becoming more national and the, and the climate of the nation was becoming more temperature hot, they hid their girls away for possibly as long as two years. We don't know exactly the length, but it was between one and two years. And also, we have no clue where they hid them. None at all. Except that Dred Scott said that if they needed to, they could call them back at any moment. So that lets me know that they were really right under their noses. But they were hidden away for their safety's sake because at that time, um, we had Lumpkin's jail we visited today with Pastor T. There was uh, the linchpins in St. Louis, meaning a place to store the slaves. And so um, there was a woman, which I call the madam, who bought and sold young girls because they were likely to, likely to bear children soon, which would bring them more profits and more benefit. And Dred and Harriet didn't want that. So they hid the girls away until they knew what their disposition was. And I can only imagine but one of the things we only guess at right now is that maybe someone from the Blow family hid them away. And we have a good reason for suspecting <coughs> that, but we can't prove it. And so, you know, at another time I can say why. But uh, here's the last thing on the girls. The older daughter had, we thought, two children. And yet we found out she had five, maybe six. Four of them, of course, died very young, but we do have their dates of birth and dates of death. And we have all of that from genealogical records, which we never would have had before. And then we found out that Dred and Harriet both have two of those infants that died, one each buried in their graves, which means that Dred and Harriet's graves were open, and one of their baby infant grandchildren was interred with them. <coughs> that was unusual and very shocking. So the baby girl, um, Lizzie, was born in 1846. She lived through the Dred Scott decision. She lived through Lincoln becoming president. She lived through the Civil War. She lived through the Lincoln assassination. I should have said, she lived through the Jim Crow era, the Black Codes. She lived into 1900s. She lived through the Depression. She saw World War I and she saw World War II. I had her last name, which we know she never got married, but she changed her last name Remembering that she lived 11 years in fear. The rest of her life she lived pretty much still close, if you will. Very severe, tall woman, but she was very uh, sequestered unto herself and her family. Uh, she died in 1945 at the age of 99. And my father and his sister, the sixth and seventh of my grandmother's children, they knew her until they were in their late teens and she babysat them when they were infants. So think about the fact that Dred Scott's daughter babysat my dad. <laughs> That's crazy. That's crazy. Very, yeah. So go home and do your genealogy. You never know what you'll find. <laughs> no surprises. But you know, and that helped us a lot to, to understand more of the story. And the oral tradition I was told about her death matched her death certificate perfectly when I gave people the right last name, which only three of us knew. Uh, we have a number of questions from the audience, so let me try to get to some of those. The first one is about the play uh, that you went to see. Uh, and the question is, what was the name of the play? Uh, is it still being performed, or are there plans for it to be performed? And if someone were interested in trying to purchase the play or to bring the play to Richmond, who would they contact? Uh, so the name of the play is A Man of His Time. And you can imagine why that's the name. I mean, about Tawny, a man of his time. And uh, NPR uh, actually has a podcast called Playing on Air. And they produced the play 
uh, it's on radio, but they produced it. It's, and Sam Watterson, you know Sam Watterson from, mm -hmm. what's it called, Carol? Law and Order. Law and Order and all this. And, and, a, and a wonderful black, act, black Shakespearean actor played the Scott character, and I'm having a brain cramp. I want to. I'm not going to come up with his name, I'm embarrassed, but anyway, if, if, if you Google a man of his time at NPR, the NPR podcast uh, playing on air, you may be able to find it. If not, um, anybody here, can, I'll give you my email address and you can just email me and I'll, I'll get you uh, the, the contact. I'll con in, in terms of putting the play on, uh, the play has been, you know, the play, the play's available to be put on. Now, what, what happened after, it's a one-act play, and some people that were saw it who were uh, uh, excited about it, commissioned our daughter to write a full-length version of the play. Mm. She's just finishing now. So a full-length version of the play will probably be produced, uh, we hope, well, we'll see, later this year, early next year. And uh, and I think uh, both plays at some point will be available. And one thing, when we, when we were meeting with some of your representatives today, and they asked, well, what can, what can we be doing? And we said, well, it might be a, I mean, that play, as we were talking about it, if, if you brought that play, if, if, if if the group that we're here with, uh, Virginia's Reconciliation, brought that play to Richmond and invited a lot of people who were in their corners, you know, to come out of their corners and come see this play and have a talk back after the play, I think some interesting things would happen. And I think, and my daughter, I know the play's been put on other places, so the play, the, the one act play is available. I think it's up to her. I shouldn't say it's available. She would decide. But contact me and I'll do my best. But you may be able to find it uh, on the radio, the, the Playing On Air uh, podcast. Uh, Lynn, this is for you. The question is, you mentioned how hard it was to hear uh, Mr. Tony's apology or in, in that episode. And the question is, what was the hardest thing for you to hear from him? Well, forgive me, I don't recall saying that, but um, you know what was hard? It wasn't so much hearing something that he said, but it was, I had empathy for hearing him say it at all. It was more about that, because I can only imagine that she was on the other foot. Um, I applaud him and uh, Bertrand Hayes Davis, who is the great-great-grandson of uh, Jefferson Davis, the Confederate president, because they both are accepting their histories, and they're not whitewashing it, and they're sharing it. Um, some things you can't put a good spin on, but I will say this, that in each case, and, and a few others, there are stories about these individuals and their lives mm -hmm. that would shock you, and you would be amazed and surprised and find it to be a pleasant thing. Uh, as he alluded to earlier, had it not been for the Dred Scott case, Tawny probably would have gone down as one of the better, if not one of the best chief justices based on the work that he had done prior to. But we don't know what all that was. And yet, Bert, um, his ancestor, had something to do with uh, setting up the Smithsonian, for which now we have an African American Smithsonian, without which we wouldn't. You know, so these are different ways to look at things and think about them instead of just having that uh, reaction first, because they were, they're people, they're men, and we all know how many men are, but. <laughs> I just had to get that in there. Uh, but, but there's, well, the word that he used, but they're complicated. They were complicated people. And so, again, if I had to put the shoe on the other foot and say, well, my ancestor was the bad guy, you know, would I want to be out here talking about him, or what would I be able to say about him, or how would it go across, or would people hate me, or how, how's this going to work? And yet, because of the honesty and, and the truth and, and reality and the acceptance of it and all of that, I think that it was not so hard to hear, but it was, it was, I was empathetic for him because I knew that this was a brave and bold move and it could not have necessarily been as easy as my role was. I'm assuming this question is to both of you and regarding your efforts at reconciliation and these efforts, what has been your biggest challenge? <coughs> we don't have any challenges. <laughs> I, I think the, the, only, the only real challenge is, is just the opportunity to do this. You know, we both have other lives, we're both busy, and I think, you know, we, we'd like to do more of it, and uh, 
you know, and this happened pretty quickly, Lynn called me and said, hey, I just got this call about the Virginia of Reconciliation. You want to go to Richmond? I said, okay, good, let's go to Richmond. And here we are, like, bang, like in about a week. So, so we get these chances and we take them where we can get them. But I, I, I think the biggest challenge is just we, we wish we could do more of this because it, it, seems, it seems to work. Yeah, I really don't know. We're very optimistic people, so if something is what we might call difficult, we just say, well, let's figure out how to do it. I mean, that's just the truth. It just is. I know everybody's not like that, but I don't, the challenge might be something like today where we have 18 places to be <laughs> and 12 interviews, but uh, other than that, it's, it's a joy. It, it's not <laughs> difficult because we know that we are doing something that people are responding to in a positive way. And so it really energizes us because you would not believe the day that we've had, but I'm like, I could stay up till three in the morning and do this. So we're gonna stay. Given the role, uh, most slaves obviously did not have property, uh, and this inability to own or acquire property reinforced through Jim Crow, uh, which made that very difficult. What role do you see land, property, and access to natural resources playing in reconciliation? Resources. I guess, it's, well, for me, this leads to the issue of, uh, a, a quite, well, I don't think it's the issue, but it relates to the issue of reparations. Uh, and I, and I, for me, the issue of reparations, the response to that is, well, Let's, let's talk about it for a minute. If, if you believe that there's been, it has been for generations this institutional racism in this country, and if you believe it still exists and it's still holding people back, it's still keeping people from realizing their potential, and, and I, 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 don't, I think this room would agree that probably is still the case, well then you need an institutional response to that. You need, you need for, so for me reparations are, are making the policy decisions and the investment decisions to say, you know, we're going to go fix this. You know, we're going to make investments in following the law to prevent redlining where it's happening. Because the laws exist, they're not being enforced. I mean, they're not, they're not in place, get them in place. We're, we, we know that the funding, and I, as I understand it here in Virginia, it's true also, the funding, the way your schools are funded, is inequitable. Right. And, and, and so, so the, for me, the reparations decision is we recognize institutional racism, therefore we need to make an institutional decision on policy and investment to go fix those. So, so for me, and that would, yeah, I guess, gets back to land and resources because it, it impacts issues like redlining and the capacity of people to own homes. I mean, Pastor T made a great point today talking on the slave trail uh, about the way the way people's homes are valued, and so black, black folks have homes that were so low, so low valued, they could never accrue any uh, equity, and they could they couldn't have anything to pass on to their children because of the way that different neighborhoods were zoned and treated from a, from an assessment standpoint. So and Charlie, uh, even if I can, because this was really important, he said if a black home had an elevator in it, which meant that this was a very nice home, just because it was over here, it was still valued less than just a, maybe a two-bedroom bungalow house over here that belonged in a white neighborhood. And that, to me, was the issue. That was horrible. Yeah. So, so I think, so I think, and so where does the political will come for that? Well, you know, for terms of reconciliation, I, I go back to that. I mean, they have, they have some pretty interesting policy areas they want to work in, and they start to touch on these kinds of issues. So I think, so people like us, we've got to drive our leaders, our political leaders, to say, you know, what are you doing about this? Come on, this exists. Of course, the problem is, is, is Ben and I were talking about driving back to the slave trail today, is that, you know, I'll just say it, too, ma too many white Americans don't recognize the problem. If you, if, you, if you took a poll in America, white Americans said, do you think institutional racism exists in America, I'd be afraid to hear what the number would be. But I bet you the majority of white Americans would say, no, that's, no, we had a black president. Everything's fine. What do you mean, institutional? What, where? Well, I don't get it. They don't, they don't even admit it exists. So how can you deal with something you don't even admit exists? So that's, but that comes back to reconciliation. You've got to change hearts and minds, get people to recognize, to tell the truth, to face it, to say, yeah, it exists. What are we going to do about it? So I think that's, these are all, I think, tied together. Ask the same question to black Americans if you get different poll numbers. Oh, yeah, you know, yeah exactly. they get a different answer. Uh, Two similar questions. Um, this one says, I grew up in a multicultural community near Washington, D.C. 
I've interacted with the black community on multiple levels, still do. When and how do you engage in a grassroots apology? How and when? Did you answer? Uh, I, I, I wrap my mind around that one, a grassroots yeah. apology. I'm not, I'm not sure what that means. Uh, I'm not sure I know what that means, unless, I guess, I mean, building on the breaking bread thing we're doing up in Connecticut, and we've never, it's an interesting point. I thought about that. I mean, I, I, we've never gotten to that point. We're just getting to know folks. We haven't gotten to the point of getting down to those kinds of brass tacks, but I guess that's maybe where it starts to happen. I don't know. You know, we have a program uh, that we're going to roll out soon. My, my husband created called the Moccasin Project, and it was around the same time that Charlie did the Breaking Bread because my husband, Brian, his idea was that, you know, people need to walk a mile in my shoes. And so that's another way that you process that. I mean, you can create your own program just on that concept alone. But once you've walked in those person's shoes and then you understand the pain and agony or the mistreatment or injustice and so forth, then you can say, wow, I actually do get it now. Um, can I share a story real quick here, too? It, it kind of goes to what you're saying. Um, an apology didn't happen from the right person, but just uh, barely a week and a half ago, I, I will leave out all the markers, but I was somewhere, and we, we saw a program. At the end of the program, an elderly white man came over and spoke to the gentleman who was to my right. And I was talking to someone here, so I really didn't hear anything they said, but when he uh, spoke to him, the African-American gentleman said, man, where did you get that effing statement from? Get out of my face. And I went, whoa, what? what? And I was appalled. I'd never, you know, what, what is he doing? So he, the man tried to say something. He, he repeated, just get out of my face. And then the man turned and walked away. So this, this other fellow left, and the gentleman walked past me. But I just couldn't let it go, and I, I didn't put my hand on his arm, and I said, excuse me, is anything wrong? And he said, well, I, I, I just went over and I, I said to him, you know, black people really make good athletes. <laughs> and then he said all of that to him, and I, I, he was just totally befuddled, totally befuddled. And so I said, well, I said, first of all, I want to apologize to you, and that was me apologizing. Because uh, I said he was very rude, and that was crude language, and no matter what, I'm sorry, I don't think you deserve that, but let me help you understand why he felt that way. And I proceeded to share with him that that's a stereotypical comment, and this gentleman did not know this man, and yet he came over and said something to him that he took offense to, and he took offense to it because it's like, well, that's all we do is do sports. I don't have a brain. I, I don't have a degree, I, I don't have a life, I'm, I'm just an athlete, which in some people's minds could be like, I'm a resource, I'm an asset, I make money for you all. And so, as I spoke to him about it, I saw his face change and he smiled and he said, oh, and it's like, I get it. Okay, I said, do you, do you get it? I do, I really do. And then he, his whole body changed because now he said, you know, if I had known, I would have never said that. And so the point of that story is that a lot of people think that other people do what they do on purpose, that they know what's wrong, and they do this stuff. And the truth is, you all don't know the history either. And you don't know when you're saying something offensive because you just don't know and you haven't had that R word. What's the R word? Relationship. And so uh, I was happy to have intervened. I was very disappointed in my brother, but, um, but that was... So I don't know if you call that grassroots, you know, but it wasn't them apologizing, it was me apologizing, you know, because one of the things about uh, reconciliation is that there are people who are willing to come up and, and, and recognize the wrongs and the ills, but our, our African American people have to also be ready to hear that and have a heart to forgive at some point, because I've seen too many people be snubbed who I know were really trying, and yet, um, they would never give an opportunity to really get into a relationship where it could actually happen, and that's disappointing. I, I have a thought, though, about grassroots, and it comes back to the role of the, of, of the, of the faith community. You know, what if part of the, what if part of uh, Virginia's for reconciliation? What if one of their programs was to organize an interfaith 
citywide event, which would be a reconciliation event. That's what we're <laughs> Well, okay, or, or, or I mean a big event where people would, uh, the work would be done ahead of time, and a lot of people will come together, and a lot of white folks would recognize the harm that's been done since slavery up until now, and would rec and, and would recognize the harm, would speak truth to the harm that's been done, would speak truth to institutional racism, and if, and if it was a, if it was if it was held in your local sports arena, and you had. You know, 5,000 white people doing that. You had 5,000 black people forgiving them. And they met at the 50 yard line and had a great coming together of forgiveness. And then I think that could be a very powerful group that could work for change. So I think you could have, you could organize grassroots reconciliation, but someone has to lead it. And I think since we're at a, a school that is a school of faith, I think the faith community, that's the kind of leadership they should provide. Let me follow up with kind of the flip side of that last question. What strategies or practical advice do you have for talking to a self-professed white supremacist? Oh. <laughs> you know, I'm not sure I have that answer, but uh, I will say that we do have a group in St. Louis called Hate Breakers, and they specifically work with, I, I forgive me, but skinheads is what they say that's what they call skinheads and people who think along those lines and uh, they have a very powerful video of a young man who was working with those individuals and yet he began to see such evil happening within that group that he started to be uncomfortable on the inside and so the hate breakers group know what kind of things to say to people like that to help them continue to draw away from that and so ultimately this young man um, actually became um, a reconciler and has a great friendship with an African American and totally has pulled away from that group. So I'm not sure because I haven't, we're gonna collaborate with them, but I, I don't know the specifics about how they went about doing that, but they are very effective. So it can be done. I have no idea. <laughs> uh, white supremacist? I, I, my, my bias would be to say, Satan, get behind me. I mean, what can you say to a white supremacist? They're dug in on that. I mean, I, I mean, they're, I, I mean I'm sorry, but I might have to those. There's something wrong with them. I don't think any conversation with me is going to fix it. All right, the question mentioned Virginia specifically, but I think probably broader. What is the most important thing that needs to happen in Virginia? And I know you're not Virginia expert. So in the broader context, what's the most important thing to say? I'm going to say what I said earlier today, and, uh, and I said this to uh, former Governor Bob McDonald, that I would love to see the reconciliation model that they hope to present and in fact become one that's so effective that knowing that the slave ships embarked here, and that this history exists, that through the reconciliation efforts that you're trying to have, that you can go full circle so that at the end of the day, you're going to undo that history. And it can be Virginia who has the reputation for reconciliation and not just the 400 that we all are recognizing this year. That would be my hope. And, uh, yeah, I, I, agree with that. I mean, wouldn't, wouldn't it be wonderful if the state <coughs> <coughs> South and Mason Dixon line showed the way. And, uh, and something like Virginia's reconciliation, I mean, again, because it's so bipartisan and it has every faith community in it, it could be, that could be a vehicle. That's, that's, a, that's a very powerful beginning. Out of your efforts and your experiences now in this effort, uh, the question is, have you ever thought of creating a training module to teach people how to turn controversy into opportunities. Okay, yes and no. I haven't had time to create it, but we always talk about what kind of things we can do. But I will share with you something that we do in St. Louis. And when I say we, though, this time it's not my foundation, but it's called the Ethics Project. It's a friend of mine. And we support each other and participate in programs when we can. Uh, she has a National Youth Summit and uh, every year we go somewhere to like Atlanta or the Kennedy Center, Howard, Morehouse, we've been to these locations, also in St. Louis. And 400 students come and they get to meet legends, they call them the legends, so I represent Dred Scott. 
And we teach these young children about the history and how they can engage in their, you know, millennials or whatever, what they can do today. <coughs> but one of the things that um, she has done is created something called Mother to Mother. And with Mother to Mother, white women and black women come together and let's say we were in this room, we would have tables of rounds and there would be four women at a table. And, and it started out with the Ferguson that black women wanted to share with white women what it is they have to say to their sons that white women don't have to say to theirs. And I can see the heads nodding. And it's, it's not just driving while black, it could be driving while breathing. You know, um, they're hard conversations, but they share and they talk and they learn. And, and it's a great awakening for many mothers so that they now have some compassion and they understand, well, I didn't have to raise my child that way. This isn't right, that's not fair. And so it's, it's a training in a sense, you know, because you're bringing people together and you're teaching them about another way that another culture has to live. And they have to live that way because of the things that have happened in the past. And we need to correct that. Uh, last question, and then uh, I want to turn it over to Governor McDonald. Uh, what would you say to the students of these two universities? Mm -hmm. oh, you want me to go? Well, I, you know, having four kids and nine grandkids, I mean, you're our hope. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We're depending on you. You know, we didn't leave you a wonderful world for you all to work with young people out there, but, you know, you're the hope of the world. You know, you can do anything. You're smart. You're determined. Mm -hmm. You know, you can hopefully clean up this mess uh, we left you. But, uh, please God, you've got the will and the courage and the wisdom to do it, because we're depending on you. Yeah, I, I would say a couple of things, too. You know, first I want to share this because um, I just think it's critically important, uh, and I think you all would understand this, but uh, the Daughters of the American Revolution had a very bad reputation because they stuffed Mary Anderson and would not let her sing at Constitution Hall. And Eleanor Roosevelt took her to the Lincoln Memorial in 1939, where she got to sing before 75,000 people. And, um, and, and that just is a horrible time in our history on the one hand. The Daughters of the American Revolution have since turned around and they now have black chapters, they have black presidents, they have opened their doors and they have given an incredible tribute to Mary Anderson. Again, these are not their grandmothers and their great grandmothers, these are the women of today. Um, I have the incredible honor of having received their Medal of Honor because of the work I do with Dred Scott and I've been invited to at least seven opportunities to teach them this history. So I think that's worth noting, and I'd like to share that because that's a reconciliation moment. That's a reconciliation event. Uh, and yet, as it pertains to young people, I first feel that I, we're responsible for them. I feel like our generations have let them down. I do not blame them. If you were born in 2004 or 1996, that was the world you were born into. And the things that they are dealing with, the things that are happening that they see, that they think are good and right, it's not their fault. We let that happen. So I say to the young people, you know, first I would say go back to God. And read your Bible. I, I know, I, I, you know so don't edit that out. <laughs> read your Bible. Find out what truth is and, and reconciliation is in there. And be a good person. Be that right person. But I don't blame you. And yet, when I go out and actually get to engage with young people like that youth summit I mentioned, there are so many remarkable young people out there. Don't let television sway our opinions of our young people. They are phenomenal. And it's just like the news, you know, these wonderful reconciliation things are happening, but you're not seeing it on television. So get involved and, uh, and have hope and believe that there are those of us out here who still want to help you and just call on any of us, you know. Uh, we, we're trying to have friends of Dred Scott, young friends of Dred Scott. We don't have very many uh, because I haven't had time to develop that, but I would love to bring them up under our umbrella and help teach them, you know, our histories and how we can get along. But, but there is hope, like I said, there's hope. And the hope is you. Don't give up. Don't give up on them. Uh, well, in, in closing, let me say thank you to the Virginians for reconciliation. Uh, 
thank you to Lynn and Charlie for being here. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. And if I could close briefly uh, with uh, one of my favorite quotations from the Bible, Isaiah 6, 8, where the prophet says, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Who shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I. Send me. So I think that's the message from reconciliation. We each have to be willing to stand up and say, Here am I. Send me. Thank you very much. It's now my distinct honor and privilege to introduce the former governor of the Commonwealth of Virginia. Welcome him back to Virginia Union University, Governor Robert McDonald. What a beautiful evening, and uh, it's uh, awesome to have spent this day with two uh, incredibly beautiful Americans, uh, Lynn Jackson and Charlie Tony. Uh, the courage they've had to do what they did two years ago and now travel the country to be able to tell their story of forgiveness and truth-telling and restoration and forgiveness and honesty and, uh, and joy in this relationship separated by 160 years of history to now spend these two years of, of joy and love for one another to tell people as a model of how to, how to put things from the past uh, in perspective with honest conversation and then find ways to reconcile, reconcile and inspire other people. Uh, I couldn't be more uh, inspired from you two today. Let's give our panelists again a round of applause. I want to say that uh, this is really momentous, I think, for Virginia. There's never been a United States Supreme Court case that's had the impact of the Dred Scott decision. You know, one poor, courageous, enslaved Virginian deciding to uh, take his case to the highest court in the land to be able to pursue his freedom. Uh, that led to a case that was uh, so wrongly decided and so bad uh, that it led uh, in part to a civil war and then led to three constitutional amendments. There's never been a case like this in the history of America. And so I applaud Lynn for what she did uh, over 20 years ago to be able to preserve the legacy of her great great grandfather, uh, Red Scott, to be able to tell the story that just cannot be forgotten in American history because it's been the most consequential uh, judicial decision uh, in the 240 years of American history. But the lesson of it is what do we do with it uh, today? And that's why uh, over a year ago, Virginia's for Reconciliation started with people of goodwill, black and white, Republican, Democrat, uh, Christian and secular, that all had one goal in mind, and that is to, in this 400th year since the enslaved Africans walked on the uh, shores of Virginia on August 25th of 1619 to Fort Monroe, Virginia, uh, what now do we do moving forward to uh, honor the words of Genesis? which says that uh, God cre created each of us in his image and likeness, all the same, all equal. Uh, what do we do now to give life to the words of Thomas Jefferson, slave owner, but yet author of the Declaration of Independence, the man of contrast like Roger B. Tani, uh, who said that we're all, uh, we get to, we're endowed by our creator with certain inalienable rights, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, all equally. But that didn't apply to people of color in 1776 when those words were written. So what now? And that's what Virginians for Reconciliation is about, to ask each of us in this year, 400 years into the, uh, in, in, into the uh, great American uh, experiment of people of color and people of European descent living in the, same, uh, in the same country, the first 350 years plus not being very good. What, what do we do? What's our duty? And I think you all laid it out very well in your summary, given the challenge to, uh, to our audience. And that is, again, hearkening to the words of Jesus, why should we worry about the speck in our brother's eye before we take the log out of our own? So this is a great opportunity here in this message to say what's in our heart? What are our prejudices? Uh, what are our biases that prevent us from having the ability to follow the two great commandments, love God, love your neighbor. You do that, and I think it's a pretty good life. So I, I'm just so inspired by this time that I've spent this 24 hours now with these two uh, beautiful human beings that have found a way across the divides of history to set a model for how to, how to reconcile. And that's what we're gonna work on in the church uh, with our pastors. So many of our members are here today. 
in the education system, in the government system, uh, in the arts and culture, uh, and in business, the great purveyors of the culture. What can each leader, those leaders in each of those areas do to make this a year of, of truth-telling and forgiveness and repentance and reconciliation and re restoration? That's what they've done. I think we have a beautiful opportunity. Virginia's led the way in so many things. There's no reason, as you laid down the gauntlet earlier, there's no reason Virginia can't take a historic role yet today uh, in doing this as a model for the nation. So I thank you for that challenge. I want to thank, in addition to our panelists, uh, Paul Hedges and Ryan Sensman. Paul and Ryan, are you here? They did all the legwork. Thank you. Stand up and let us recognize you. I want to thank uh, Virginia Union University and Virginia Commonwealth University, uh, the President. Uh, I called Mike Rowell, I called, uh, I called uh, uh, the President here to Virginia Union University, ha Hakeem Lucas, and both of them could not have been any more supportive, any more enthusiastic uh, about being able to host this forum. And, and again, the leadership of Virginians for reconciliation. All of you that are on the committee, please stand up and be recognized that Virginia Virginia's for Reconciliation panel, please stand up and let us thank you for your leadership. Um, so that's the end of the evening. Thank you so much for coming. I hope you're inspired. Go and be a good neighbor. This will be a better Virginia and a better America. Thank you.